All right, so last time we, um, we ended with uh, an actual and very practical, very useful um, pre-stack migration method. Uh, because we figured out what is, what is the impulse response of pre-stack migration, at least in constant velocity. So really all we did was, was take a, uh, an equation for the uh, travel time in, in two dimensions. You know, this isn't a three-dimensional equation yet. We took the, an equation for the travel time in three dimensions for a reflection or a diffraction from a source down to a diffracting ball bearing or, or uh, Huygens point, and then back up to a, a receiver somewhere else on the surface, you know, not necessarily at the source. So um, we have now a, uh, a way of uh, figuring out, you know, through that impulse response, you know, if we have a big reflection that appears at some time and some offset at some midpoint, we can now figure out, you know, where that uh, reflection has to come from. And it's going to be somewhere along that, um, in, in 2D, uh, ellipsoidal path with the source and the receiver as the two foci. So that's uh, uh, an, uh, really quite a simplification. Uh, and of course, what um, stacking and uh, uh, NMO correction all assumes is that the uh, reflection is, is coming from the bottom of the ellipse. It's the reflection is coming from where the ellipse is, uh, uh, the ellipsoidal surface is flat, you know, from the deepest possible point. But as we know, you know, uh, and, and we'd like to find reflectors that are not at zero dip, and so now we know where else they could occur. And, and like, uh, like in general in seismic imaging, what we need is to have um, multiple observations so we can draw lots of those ellipsoids and see where they all meet and where they all reinforce each other and um, where the, uh, the, you know, what part of the ellipsoids are going to cancel out and are, are just going to be left out there all by themselves. OK, so now we need to, um, uh, and, and we did this in 706 as well. We had an actual, you know, with that impulse response of zero offset migration, we had an actual practical migration method right at the beginning. OK, and so we're going to do two things in this class. We're going to. Uh, of course, uh, in, a, in a little bit here, we're going to go on and we're going to fully develop that ellipsoidal superposition into a practical and useful um, method for, for imaging. Okay? And especially important is we're going to develop that fully for any type of velocity variation. We're, we're not going to be stuck anymore with velocity varying only with depth, z. We're not going to be stuck anymore um, with uh, constant velocity. Uh, we're going to allow velocity to vary in any way that, uh, that it does and that we can measure uh, in the field. And we're going to talk about how to measure those laterally varying velocities. That's the subject of tomography and, and uh, velocity optimization. Uh, so we'll cover that. The, the other thing that we're going to do here is we're going to follow the path of 706, but now for uh, zero offset. I mean, now for multi-offset, for non-zero offset. All right, and this involves uh, building a migration as we did in 706 uh, out of two elements. Okay, now that we've defined the impulse response, we have the imaging condition. Okay, remember we imaged uh, reflectors uh, from zero offset data sets at time t equals zero. All right, and effectively, the um, um, effectively the multi-offset ellipsoid describes the same sort of thing. You know, there is a t equals zero in there. Um, there isn't really an exploding reflector, but we're going to see what what exactly we're looking for there for an imaging condition. Uh, and then we're going to investigate uh, some ways of downward continuation. We're going to adopt some of those methods that we studied in 706 for downward continuation. 
and we're going to apply them to the multi-offset imaging condition. All right. So what we're going to end up with is, is a multi-offset migration, a pre-stack migration, which is defined in exactly the same way as we defined uh, post-stack zero-offset migration in 706. It's a downward continuation plus an imaging condition. And that's also, we're going to take that knowledge and then apply it to improve the uh, superposition migrations, the Kirchhoff um, uh, time and space domain um, pre-stack migrations that uh, are, are going to be our, our real tools for doing real work. Okay? But I do want to uh, I do want to set up today the theory, uh, probably today and tomorrow. I'm going to set up the theory for um, looking at uh, multi-offset imaging, defining the multi-offset imaging condition, defining um, and and applying the same sorts of downward continuations that we that we had in um, um, uh, that we had in in um, uh, 706. So, um, you know, how do we do downward continuation with h not equal to zero? You know, in 706, we we let h equal to zero and enjoyed all the simplifications that resulted from that. So, uh, uh, this is going to be called survey sinking. You know, we're we're not just sinking the uh, uh, the surface here, um, uh, not just downward continuing the wave field. We're we're sinking the whole survey here. And we're going to do it one element of the survey at a time. So um, uh, we've got to downward continue. To, to sync the whole survey, we've got to downward continue the sources. And we've got to downward continue the receivers. All right? Uh, and uh, let's see what the imaging condition uh, is that results. So the actual experiment is uh, here at the top. These are all, all three cross sections, right? You see x. And z, and uh, so here's our actual experiment. We've got some reflectivity down here. I've made it almost flat for you know just uh, simplicity. And there's our our source at or near the surface, and there's our receiver at or near the surface. Um, so that's our our physical experiment. So let's say we come in first. We down downward continue the receivers. Okay. So now you know. We're drawing the. Not only are we deepening the receiver, we're drawing the receiver along the same ray, okay, in, you know, to, to follow the ray. So notice that the uh, uh, the offset from the midpoint of this receiver has changed. It's kind of a critical point. And likewise, we downward continue the sources. So this source gets downward continued, and notice that it it draws nearer to the receiver. S draws nearer to G. Okay, so um, um, what uh, what you can see is that the the point we'd like to get to is this image point, the bounce point here, and uh, you know you can guess what's going to happen to the offset when we get to that image point. Not only are we we're going to have the source on top of the receiver, and so. We're going to have our imaging condition is going to include time t equals zero, and it's also going to include offset h equal to zero. So really, we're just elaborating on our imaging condition here, in the same way to downward continue and get to the image point. Uh, just to just to remember now, you know, since we uh, uh, when we note that when we downward continue the sources, I flipped. The source and receiver, okay, because we can only downward continue recorded data. So we have to invoke this concept of reciprocity that we discussed in 706, and there are situations where reciprocity really doesn't hold, um, but for now we'll consider those to be rare, and we'll allow we'll allow reciprocity to work. So we can uh, we can flip the source and receiver position, you know, exactly. No problem. All right. That just assumes that uh, you know the reciprocity assumes that that this the wave recorded here, okay, at the source looks exactly like the wave recorded from a source at the source point 
to a receiver at the receiver point. Okay? If we flip the situation around, we still get this exactly the same wave. It doesn't, uh, of course, it matters where exactly the ray path is, but it doesn't matter whether we're, we're propagating left to right along that ray path or right to left, as long as it's the same ray path. John, yeah. do you have to do that to preserve the ray path? Is that why you're doing that? No, uh, um, just to apply the downward continuation, because you know in 706, we only applied downward continuation to receivers. We had an exploiting reflector. Right, and and uh, so we um, we can only downward continue a data set that uh, uh, that was at the receivers. You know, we can only downward continue a recorded data set. And so, so kind of flips back and forth. right, right, right. Uh, you know, and that's a good question. You know, do you have to downward continue in stages? You know, one meter at a time, flipping back and forth between the source and receiver, maybe. If you're using a finite difference method for downward continuation, if you're using a Fourier method, you're going to do it all at once. You know, maybe even in, maybe even both at the same time. And and that can that can bring up issues as well. All right. Uh, so, well, maybe I. Uh, I don't remember. Maybe we didn't explore reciprocity in 706. Sorry for my uh, my memory blip here. Okay, reciprocity states that the wave field I get from source S to receiver G is exactly the same as equals the wave field I get, the the P uh, pressure field I get from. Um, with the source at receiver point G and the receiver at source point S. Flipping the source and receiver gives exactly the same seismogram. And, and you know, if you think about this intuitively, you know, whether you're propagating from left to right or right to left, as long as the as long as the the ray path is the same, the velocity should be the same, right? Uh, and, and Snell's law works the same way. In both directions, you know. So as long as you 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 know, it doesn't make any. You don't even have to know the ray path. Uh, it's going to take whatever ray path it is, and it would be the same, you know, no matter where the source is. Okay. So for reciprocity, uh, we need the sources and receivers to take each other's places exactly. Um, S and G have to be the same kind of impulse and detector. Uh, and that's not always true. Um, if we have vertical component geophones, and we have a, uh, a hammer hitting vertically or a vibrator vibrating vertically, uh, then we do have perfect reciprocity. Um, but if you have an explosion in a hole and a vertical geophone, um, then you know you might want to think about it. You may need some uh, you may need some static corrections. You may need uh, uh, some wave shaping. Some filtering to um, uh, before you you can be satisfied that you have a exact uh, reciprocity, okay? Uh, and and you have to take care of the radiation patterns. So here's a little example. There's a it's it's kind of a cross section here, but each the plot of of each um, uh, of each radiation or sensitivity pattern is really a polar plot. <clears throat> and so uh, if you look at a uh, at the effect of a let's 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 start on the right hand side, okay? We got a hydrophone uh, that's being towed um, uh, three meters below the surface of the of the ocean, okay? That hydrophone uh, is built so that it is equally sensitive to waves arriving from any direction, acoustic waves arriving from any direction, okay? Um, now, of course. That's an individual hydrophone element. If you put a bunch of hydrophone elements in an array, such as a, a streamer, especially a seven-kilometer long streamer, okay, then then you know your sensitivity is going to be very different, okay. But a single hydrophone uh, is, uh, and so the the, the uh, assumption that we'll make at first is that a single-channel hydrophone recording is going to be equally sensitive in all directions, and so. There's the polar plot of sensitivity is a circle. It's got the same uh, radius, the same sensitivity 
uh, no matter what the direction in this 2D section. Uh, geophone, on the other hand, is a, is a little bit different. If you're looking at P waves, the vertical geophone, uh, a velocity uh, geophone, a moving coil uh, uh, geophone, is most sensitive, and it's built to be most sensitive to um, P waves that are coming straight up. So there's a maximum, you know, the center of the polar plot is here. There's a maximum sensitivity uh, that's right here. And um, the polar, this, this representation of the polar plot is, is really uh, of uh, the uh, sine squared, the cosine squared of the, uh, of the polar angle, of the angle of propagation. So when you, come, uh, when you come up to 90 degrees, in other words, a P wave propagating horizontally, it should have zero sensitivity. Okay, so that's an approximate uh, representation of a um, of a uh, of a geophone's uh, sensitivity. Okay, now that's uh, not too bad a match to a uh, uh, a single vibrator. And if you're considering P waves and you ignore all the you know ninety percent of vibrator energy, especially in the in the you know the 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 low velocity soils uh, that we have here in, in Western Nevada. Um, probably ninety five percent of the vibrator energy is radiated away as surface waves. Okay, so let's let's ignore that. Let's assume that the surface waves are not a problem, and we're just looking at the P wave radiation by the vibrator. Okay, the uh, the P wave radiation by the vibrator is is very similar. It's uh, it's also cosine squared. You know, with the maximum straight down, okay, and zero. Uh, you know, the vibrator is essentially radiating zero P wave energy um, uh, to the sides at ninety degrees, so cosine squared. Um, now, uh, you know, we've all recorded data that says that that's not at all true, but um, uh, that's one way of getting started here, okay. Now you, you can do better than that by having a vibrator array. You know, let's say you have uh, uh, three vibes in phase, and then you're going to get something closer to um, you know so, uh, cosine to the fourth power. So you're you're concentrating the, the energy even more um, uh, straight down. Um, a surface blast is uh, uh, this this circle in uh, in the polar plot is a is a cosine, cosine to the first power radiation pattern. Okay, and that's a little bit broader uh, than it doesn't fall off as fast, you know, toward the uh, toward the edges, toward the sides, as the geophone sensitivity, which is more like cosine squared. Okay, um, a blast, you know, where where you uh, uh, set the cap at the top, and uh, and the uh, uh, the detonation uh, propagates downwards. It's going to have this kind of complex two-lobed sort of uh, radiation pattern. And uh, you know, if you if you consider the uh, uh, the S wave energy in the vibrator, or you're looking at uh, S waves radiated by radiated by a, a gang of uh, of S wave vibrators, then you know you got to build it up and work through the theory. It's much more complicated. Um, so, so you know, we may have to take care of these radiation patterns. We may have to figure out uh, what these radiation patterns are and, and apply them as a kind of uh, spatial um, um, uh, filter. Uh, that's not terribly difficult. And so, you know, we can make everything look like a uh, a vertical vibrator and a uh, vertical geophone. Okay. And so then then we can we can use reciprocity at will. Um, another uh, thing, there's a there's a paper uh, uh, by Finati and Roca um, in geophysics uh, way back when, and they they demonstrated a, a reciprocity failure um, that comes from differences in the scale, or you could also say fabric, of near surface heterogeneity with band limited data, and of course, especially vibrator data are band limited, you know, by definition. All right, so this is something to watch out for. Um, you know, we do if if 
if I'm setting off my sources in bouldery alluvium and I've got my receivers out in a flat playa, um, then there's, uh, you know, it turns out that, you know, you move, you can move the, uh, the source by one meter and you get a very different recording. And, and I'm sure uh, uh, some of you have, uh, you know, those of you who have any experience recording data in, on alluvium, uh, you can appreciate that fact. Um, you know, you might have a, uh, uh, you know, if you're in the middle of a soft uh, uh, sand channel, um, you get a very different record than if you're one meter away on the outside of the sand channel. Of course, this is a reason also why we use receiver arrays, source arrays, um, you know, we document very carefully the, uh, um, the service conditions when we're doing our surveys. That's all, you know, to get around this problem. Okay. <clears throat> so um, let's, uh, uh, let's start to cast our, our, uh, uh, the, the, the geometry of our situation into, into some of these um, um, Fourier domain uh, variables that allow us to, to look at, at our wave propagation using concepts as simple as the uh, uh, concepts as simple as as the um, uh, dispersion relation, right? Remember from seven o six we had a circular dispersion relation for constant velocity, okay, and uh, and that was. Uh, you know that was for the exploiting reflector model, and all of our migration methods were built on that. You know, all of our downward continuations relied on that, whether um, whether it was a Kirchhoff migration or a finite difference migration or a um, an FK migration. You know, we're going to build up the same set of technologies now, um, but for multi-offset, you know, not zero-offset migration. So just as a reminder, here's our zero offset geometry. Uh, alpha is the dip, okay, and um, we had uh, a source and receiver right on top of each other at, at h equals zero. We now know now know that is. We also now know that uh, we were really on a midpoint axis, an m axis here, not necessarily a. a it's a little more specific than an x axis, and our um, our reflection propagated. Normally, uh, perpendicularly to the uh, dipping uh, reflectivity uh, boundary, and um, you know we have some sort of distribution of reflectivity r in that m and z cross section, uh, and the uh, the the uh, the ray path, you know, both coming down from the source and then bouncing back up to the receiver, uh, there those ray paths overlap exactly. And they're they're at a uh, uh, the same dip angle alpha from the vertical, which is the uh, normal. Um, that's the normal to the to the free surface. And so we image that using a uh, a single square root upgoing dispersion relation. Um, and so that was uh, uh, k sub z, um, the uh, the vertical uh, uh, wave number uh, was equal to. Uh, Minus for upgoing propagation, okay, uh, the the square root of the quantity omega squared uh, divided by uh, v over two squared, and so now one difference from seven oh six, I'm going to drop that uh, uh, simplification we made. Um, you know, with the exploiting reflector model, we divided velocity over two and then still called it just v. Now I got to be explicit that what is in the velocity there is. Uh, uh, it's not v; it's v over two, okay? Because I'm, you know, we don't have the exploiting reflector model anymore. Can't use it, okay? So we have uh, in in what's what we now know is kz km space. We are looking at the lower half of a semicircle dispersion relation. Um, again, the the angle of propagation is here at uh, at alpha from the kz axis, and the um, um, the radius is omega over the quantity v over two. So in um, in zero offset, the uh, the wave number was related to the dip uh, in this way. Um, so we had v k z over omega 
was equal to 2 cosine alpha. You know, that just really comes straight out of the dispersion relation. And so uh, uh, you know, taking, uh, uh, taking uh, uh, you know, just, just working it around to make it as simple as possible, we have uh, VKM over omega is equal to 2 sine alpha. And uh, uh, you know, looking in the other direction, right? Um, so uh, uh, VKM over 2 omega is equal to uh, sine alpha. All right. So, so the um, what this is telling us, okay, is that um, we take a uh, 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 you know with this alpha being also the angle of propagation, the dip being the same as the angle of propagation. Okay, what this is telling us is that we take a two D data set, right, which is in in terms of um, of m and t. And we do a 2D Fourier transform on it, you know, like for a uh, for a Stolt migration, okay. And where do we find the dip? The dip is in the slope in that uh, uh, km and omega space, okay. This is kz km space here. There's also, you know, sort of perpendicular to that. There's a, a km and omega space because really the uh, you know omega could be pointing into the board here. And we have a cone, depending on what omega we're at, we have a cone, uh, or a semicircular uh, cone, half a cone. Um, so uh, if we look at the slope of that cone, you know, vkm over 2 omega, that's the sign of the dip. And that's how our, our, uh, our post-stack zero offset migrations, we're putting the dip onto our migrated sections. You know that's how the uh, it's really just the operation of the dispersion relation. Okay, so now we got to abandon all that because the path is not the same. Offset is not zero. The source is not right on top of the receiver. Didn't want to do that. <coughs> okay, so I need to go. I, I want to show you uh, Clayton's geometric analysis here. So we got the same situation, okay? Dip alpha, um, and I don't really have to. Uh, I don't really have to make it. Uh, um, uh, you know, alpha doesn't have to be small or anything. Uh, it has to be less than ninety degrees uh, for this to uh, to work. Uh, and we're looking above it, uh, whatever sense that we have of of being above it. And so let's define some. Uh, some angles here. Um, this is the the surface. This is a cross section. There's the the reflector. Okay, we've got the ray that goes down to the reflection point and back up to the surface. The reflection point is not at the midpoint, right? It's it's up dip of the midpoint because uh, of the dip. Um, and uh, this is uh, I know you can't tell, but that's a normal to the uh, surface. This here is a normal to the surface, and so we have a um, a source angle, a source prop. This is all two D now. Source propagation angle of um, uh, let's call it gamma uh, sub s. We've got a receiver arrival angle, uh, you know, relative to the normal again of uh, gamma g. Okay. Um, we can draw this this triangle here. We extend a. Uh, uh, we can draw two triangles. We extend a. Um, um, uh, we extend a, a normal from the dipping um, reflector coming up here. You know, even we have to bring it up above the surface a bit, and then we draw the the normal. So we have two right triangles in here, and you can see they get you know. They're uh, exactly the same triangle if the dip is zero, but you know as the dip increases, this triangle gets much smaller and this triangle gets much bigger. Um, but well, they 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 take different shapes as well. Um, the top of the triangle here is at that same angle to the surface alpha, the dip again, and there it is for the uh, right hand triangle. Uh, the angle uh, at the reflector is uh, let's call it beta. That's the offset angle. Um, you know, it's it's really half the offset angle, 
Um, so, uh, you know, what we're trying to do here is figure out what, how the dip is related to the, um, the slope of the arrival, the apparent velocity of the arrival at the, at the source, as it's leaving the source, and as it's arriving at the receiver. Okay? And so uh, you know, we need to somehow uh, take the dip and uh, calculate these uh, triangles and get all the angles in here. And we can get to the, uh, the source angle and the geophone angle. And once we have the geophone angle, that'll tell us, you know, in the, um, of course, the distance between the uh, source and receiver is 2h. Uh, we may get a chance to use that. OK. Um, so if we can figure out the geometry here, then um, um, we can. Uh, uh, we can get these uh, source and receiver angles, and that's what we want to be able to downward continue, right? To downward continue uh, the zero offset data, we basically have the you know this angle here is uh, uh, you know sine alpha, uh, which is which happens to be the dip for zero offset, is uh, vkm over two omega. That's something we can pull out of the Fourier transformed. Um, uh, zero offset data set. Now we have a multi offset data set. You know we want to. We can pull out. Um, uh, we can pull out vkg uh, over two omega. We can pull out vks over two omega, right? And those are going to be related to these angles here. So we got to figure out those gamma angles. Okay, so. Um, uh, well, alternatively, we can uh, relate it to uh, you know we're looking at a, uh, a midpoint gather, right? So we have a slope that's uh, uh, a slope that, that's in the midpoint direction and a slope that's in the offset direction. When we were looking at the 3D representations of uh, of the uh, shot gathers and the midpoint gathers, right? There were slopes in the midpoint direction. There were slopes in the offset direction. And so Km is, is going to, you know, Vkm over 2 omega is going to be the slope in the midpoint direction. And Vkh over 2 omega is going to be the slope in the, um, in the offset direction after Fourier transforming. And we want to relate those to uh, the dip and the offset. So first, let's relate uh, gamma g to um, uh, alpha and beta. And so Clayton's approach was just to go around this triangle and, um, <clears throat> and figure out, uh, uh, well, let's see. He started with a right-hand triangle. And I, I can almost get them, maybe if I uh, minimize this a little bit. Um, we, let's, let's, uh, let's look around the right-hand triangle. So we have beta okay, plus uh, um, uh, let's see, plus alpha, right, is part of, of this angle, plus pi over 2, OK? And so we've got, you know, you add up the angles around a triangle, you should get, you should get uh, pi, right, 180 degrees. And uh, so we got everything, you know, we, we add beta plus alpha plus pi over 2. Um, We've got everything except this. Well, this angle is uh, 90 degrees, pi over 2, uh, minus gamma g. Okay, So we add in pi over 2 minus gamma g, and all that is equal to pi. Okay, So what we get from that is uh, gamma g is equal to beta plus alpha. All right, And then, we add, then Clayton added up around the left-hand triangle on the inside, and um, so he, he has beta plus pi over 2. There's the beta. There's the pi over 2. Um, and then this is, uh, uh, this is pi over 2. This is pi over 2. Um, this angle is pi over 2 minus gamma uh, sub s minus alpha. And that all equals pi. And so. Um, uh, what we get out of that is gamma sub s is beta minus alpha. Okay. 
So the uh, source and, and geophone angles gamma sub s and gamma sub g, they're related to k, k sub s and k sub g, just like in zero offset, except that we're not taking v over 2, okay? because we don't have exploiting reflector. We're taking the full time for the full path down from the source, the bounce back to the receiver. Okay, So we have, uh, unlike what I just said, VKS over omega is equal to sine gamma sub s, and VKG over omega is equal to sine gamma sub g. Now, how do we, you know, that's KS and KG. How do we convert to, um, to uh, uh, KM and KH? You know, I, I want to do everything in, in uh, I mean, hopefully I've convinced you something about the utility of the common midpoint gather. Uh, and we know our basic location axis is M. So uh, you know, we'd like to work for a while in M and H coordinates to have that, that simplification and the ability to look at common midpoint gathers. All right. So if you, uh, if you go through, you know, if, if you take it as a coordinate transformation, and remember, uh, uh, k sub s is, as a wave number, it's, it's really just a derivative. Okay. So, so uh, uh, you know, it's like taking the derivative of the, of the, uh, of the, of the transformation, right? So k sub s is equal to um, uh, k sub m minus k sub h over 2. This is just going from the definition of, of m and h versus, um, versus s and g. Okay, so you can get these derivatives as well. These are like uh, Jacobians on the, on the, uh, um, uh, on the, uh, uh, the transformation. And k sub g, right, so where we're, wherever we see k sub g, in these relations, uh, we can substitute in k sub m plus k sub h over 2. So let's do that. Let's substitute in. And um, so we have uh, v over 2 omega uh, times the quantity uh, km minus kh is equal to uh, sine uh, gamma sub s, which is equal to sine of uh, beta minus alpha. And then we have uh, we substitute in for k sub, sub g. Uh, and so we have v over 2 omega times km plus kh. That quantity is equal to sine of gamma sub g is equal to the sine of beta plus alpha. Okay, so now we've got to separate km and kh into two different equations. Um, and so we have uh, 2 km over 2 omega is equal to uh, 1 half sine of, uh, of beta plus alpha plus 1 half sine beta minus alpha is equal to sine alpha cosine beta. And then 2kh over 2 omega is equal to 1 half sine beta plus alpha, uh, you know, same, as, uh, same as the other one, but now minus 1 half sine beta minus alpha. And that's equal to, different from what we were doing for km, cosine alpha times sine beta. All right. So you boil that down. So for multi-offset migration, you know, our migrations, no matter what we do, but directly in, in a Fourier domain migration, you know, like a, if we try to set up a multi-offset um, uh, pre-stack Kirchhoff, uh, a pre-stack Stolt migration, let's say, okay, which we will set up, all right, um, here's, what, here's the information we're going to get out, okay, and, and the dip alpha, you can see is, is you know, it's, it's kind of wrapped in with this offset beta. You kind of have to unscramble those two. Okay? So the observed slope in, the, uh, in our CMP gathers, um, with the slope in the, in the midpoint direction, this, the K, the K, which is VKM over 2 omega, that's the slope uh, in the Fourier domain in the midpoint direction. Okay? That slope is equal to the product of the sine of the dip and the cosine of the uh, of the offset. Um, now the slope in the offset direction, okay, in the Fourier domain, vkh over two omega, is equal to now the uh, the sine of the offset angle times the cosine of the dip. All right. Um, 
and I, I, you know, I wrote it in the way that Clayton does. Um, so, uh, uh, but it's, uh, I would probably uh, keep the, uh, I would probably make it, uh, uh, you know, reverse the order here, just to uh, help help myself remember it. <clears throat> so this is a, a correction to the wave number that depends on offset. You know, so no longer, right? When we were doing zero offset migration. It was very simple, you know. We would look at the slopes uh, in the um, uh, in the zero offset data, and that would give us the dip. Okay. Uh, in multi offset, of course, we've got the involvement of this offset beta, which is non-zero. Uh, notice that this reduces, you know, if you uh, if you take beta equals zero, um, then uh, uh, this is zero, right? We so it reduces to one equation, which is exactly what we saw, you know, for zero offset. So at least it's you know it's it's compatible that way. So so um, this um, uh, this Clayton uh, um, uh, this Clayton geometry analysis, you know, really explains to us where we're getting the data. On the uh, on the dip now, and you can see it's buried in you know for multi offset data it's buried in both the uh, uh, both the in the slopes in our data both in the midpoint direction and in the offset the h direction. So these equations help us interpret downward continuation and imaging in, in multi offset. Um, you know multi offset migration turns out to be the combination of two processes, right? The, notice that I said that uh, for zero, um, for zero offset, we only have this equation. Okay, so that's the post stack migration e equation essentially. What's this thing here? That turns out to be the stacking and NMO correction equation. And, and note that it's it's, you know. The standard way of doing stacking and NMO correction is 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 not, you know, the way we do migration. You know, they're very different processes in, in most uh, systems, uh, but we could do them exactly the same way because they have this have precisely the same mathematics. Okay, so if if h equals zero, we all we have left is v k m over two omega, and so then. Uh, uh, that's equal to uh, sine of the dip alpha, and what that is—that's zero offset migration, like we studied in 706. Ah, but now we realize if the dip is zero, okay, we have vkh over two omega equal to sine of the offset. That's all we have left. Okay, right? Remember, remember what 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 does migration do if if there's no dip if it's all flat? What does migration do if it, if there's no dip? Uh, your uh, a smile comes from a, an impulse. That's the impulse response. And remember, an impulse has all dips. So if there's no dip, you have purely flat layers. What does migration do? It's it migration does nothing. It's a it's a uh, it's a, it's a not exactly a no op. It's a it's a Identity operator. You know, you take a you take a, a seismic section with with all flat dips, push it through a migration. You get out the same stuff. You know, it's it's an identity operator. Okay, uh, so so you know this equation goes away for zero dip, but we still get this one. That's what stacking is. NMO correction and stacking. Okay. So what we've got is is uh, we have the full now, now of course what we have really we have neither zero dip nor zero offset so we need both of these equations to properly uh, study our our wave field okay so the full migration is approximated by um, you know it's kind of a, a, a zero order approximation of the full process. Right of both of these equations, we call it stacking and zero offset migration. 
So stacking, you know, is kind of a assumed background for for this class. And zero offset migration, you learned about in uh, 706. Okay. So let's uh, let's look at the full FK multi offset migration method. All right, for constant uh, constant velocity. All right. We have an experiment in uh, SGT space. We've got surface data, right? Here's a shot record, right? We've got these three different ray paths, uh, each uh, bouncing uh, off part of the uh, structure. Obviously, the structure is not quite uh, the way I represented it here uh, for those uh, bounce angles. Um, so there's a source and some receivers. We downward continue the receivers using upgoing waves. Okay, uh, and and how do we do that? Well, let's uh, let's go back to the methods we studied in seven oh six. First, we got to kind of update our um, our uh, um, our theory, our seven oh six theory for um, um, for the wave fields that we have now. The wave field we have now, P, we're still going to consider it very simply to be a pressure wave field. Uh, depends on the uh, the depth of the source, the depth of the receiver, right? Because we want to downward continue here. Um, it depends on the source location, the receiver location, and depends on time. That's our five dimensional um, wave field, okay? That we're going to downward continue on. We can downward continue the receivers with this wave equation, okay? Uh, this is shorthand here. P sub zz is shorthand for dp dz squared, uh, and then plus dp dg squared. Okay, so this is the uh, second derivative of the wave field in the z direction. That's the second derivative of the wave field in the receiver direction, and here is the second. Here is the second derivative of the wave field with respect to time. Right, minus uh, one over v squared uh, d squared p dt squared. That's equal to zero. That's a that's a receiver wave equation. Okay, the wave recorded at the receivers is going to is going to look like that. And we have the same Fourier duals that we started uh, uh, seven oh six with. You know uh, the operator uh, the second uh, z derivative d squared uh, uh, dz squared is uh, has a Fourier dual with minus uh, k sub z squared. Um, d squared uh, dg squared, you know, essentially the second derivative in the geophone direction, in the g direction, you know, looking along, you know, looking at the slopes of the wave field along, you know, from geophone to geophone, okay, that's uh, minus kg squared, and then uh, as 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 before, uh, d squared dt squared has a Fourier dual with uh, minus omega squared. So the Fourier transform of this wave equation on the receiver side is uh, minus kz squared times the wave field minus kg squared times the wave field p plus omega squared over v squared times p is e, and that's all equal to zero. So we have a very familiar dispersion relation, right? If we uh, uh, right, if you just uh, uh, divide out p from every term, right, which you can do here. You, we have kz squared plus kg squared is equal to omega squared over v squared. So for upgoing waves, we downward continue by getting the derivative uh, in the z direction. So kz is equal to minus the square root of omega squared over v squared minus kg squared. Okay, this is exactly the same, right? <coughs> Our downward continuation that we develop with this now, right? We're gonna Downward continue from. Um, we're going to keep the source at the surface where it is, but we're going to downward continue to uh, uh, receiver depth z sub g equal to some z, and we take the surface data, which is from z uh, z sub g equal to zero, um, and we multiply it by this uh, this downward continuing uh, 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 imaginary uh, exp exponential. Um, this Euler uh, uh, quantity here, e to the power of i times kz, which is going to be a function of omega and uh, kg, right? So there it is. There's kz, and it's a function of omega and kg, and of course the velocity times the depth we want to downward continue to. Okay, 
So we did a lot of that. You know, we uh, we worked this into a FK migration in um, uh, and and downward continuation. We we looked at approximating this uh, with finite difference uh, equations and all that. So in seven hundred six, we already covered how to do that. So now we assume that reciprocity holds. We downward continued every receiver, uh, you know, down to depth z. <clears throat> um, and now we switch the positions of all the receivers and the sources. So here's an example of, of you know, one receiver source that's already downward continued into um, three source positions that are, that are still at the surface, but now being considered receivers. Okay? And, uh, and so we can still use upgoing waves in our downward continuation. Okay? And we want to downward continue the, the pseudo receivers, which were formerly the sources. Okay, notice the waves have switched direction. All right, and uh, you know we downward continue far enough, we're going to find the image point. Right, so um, we use the wave equation here to downward continue the uh, the receivers. I'm sorry, to downward continue the sources. Right, here we're looking at you know the slopes of waves as they uh, as they change across different sources, s. So for this, we're going to use a wave equation that's exactly what we had above, except, you know, it's, well, it's still got d squared p dz squared, uh, and it's still got d squared p dt squared, it's still got the same velocity, but now what's in here is the second derivative of the wave field with respect to the source positions. That's all we do. We just substitute uh, s's for g's. Same uh, downward continuation, but now it's working on k sub s, okay, and we we invoke reciprocity again, and we're back to our same survey, except that now it's downward continued to some depth z. So here's the full operation, right? We need to downward continue once uh, versus the uh, the k sub g, and again versus the k sub s, right? And so let's let's now drop the distinction between the depth of the source and the depth of the receiver, right? So z sub s is equal to z sub g is equal to z, and so here is the full downward continuation, which is just this, you know, we, this is surface data, right? In the Fourier domain, right? We have uh, we've we've gone from s and g to s and to k s and k g from time to omega, and we're going to get out, you know, the Fourier domain. Uh, you know now 3D multi offset data set. Uh, it's still in in KS and KG and Omega, but now it's at depth Z, and we do it via you know one multiplication by one Euler exponential, you know minus I times this um, what is that psi? Um, okay, thanks. Uh, which is a function of uh, KS, KG, and Omega, and multiplying by Z. All right, and here is psi, okay, and it's got both of those uh, uh, both of those uh, dispersion relations in it, but it's got two of them. So one is the square root of the quantity omega squared over v squared minus k g squared on the receiver side, and the other one, which just gets added to it, is the square root of omega squared over v squared again minus k sub s squared on the source side. Now we're continuing both. Psi, yeah. So, 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 um, the dispersion relation uh, psi is um, is equal to um, uh, two uh, two dispersion uh, square roots, uh, like we've seen, you know, in seven hundred six, and the first one is the square root of omega squared over v squared minus k g squared. Okay, which is the that's the um, uh, the receiver side, you know how how do how do the waves slope, you know versus your array of receivers, and the second square root is um, omega squared over v squared minus k s squared, which is how the how the waves slope with respect to the source positions, your array of sources, because for a multi-offset survey you've got an array of receivers and you have an array of sources. Now of course they're 
you know, all overlapping, but you know, we have them on separate axes. Uh, so that's the multi-offset downward continuation operator, um, psi of, uh, of uh, ks, kg, and omega. It's fully separable in ks and kg. You know, we could, we could, uh, um, you know, I could send uh, my my data set to, uh, uh, you know, these are all fully separable processes. Um, you know, I could I could send my data set on a flash drive to um, uh, to a company in Canada, and they'll uh, uh, and they'll do the uh, um, the downward continuation with respect to the sources, and they could uh, then put their results on a on a flash drive and send it to a company in Houston, and they'll they'll do the uh, uh, the downward continuation with respect to the receivers. Okay, so fully separable. Which is convenient, right? Because uh, it's it makes it easier to write your programs, and you don't have to, you know, if, if it wasn't fully separable, you downward continue one meter in the sources, then one meter on the receivers, and, and so forth. Okay. Um, all right. So so um, uh, I better stop there. Um, hitting you with this first version of what's going to become the double square root equation. And I should be able to finish this uh, uh, tomorrow morning um, if, I, uh, if I can get started fast enough. So um, we're going we're gonna to go on and, uh, and figure out how to put it into the uh, M&H space and then discuss what we've got. Because uh, as, as simple as it may seem, in uh, in S and G space, we'd still much like to benefit from the um, you know being able to work in in the uh, midpoint gather space in M and H space. Um, and that also makes this uh, technology you know more explainable to uh, uh, to you know the old line of uh, of processors who are used to sorting everything into midpoint space first anyway. Um, okay, so we'll uh, we'll get that underway uh, tomorrow.